Hey everybody, it's You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions. And this week, my first question comes to me from Arte1090, who says, As someone who liked 42, what about it didn't you like? For me, it showed more about his life than the short glimpse that we always hear about, Pee Wee Reese standing up for him. Instead, it showed some actual scenarios that he may have faced, that coach screaming the N-word 9,000 times, as well as the owner of the Dodgers not really caring about making a difference, but just doing it for the money. 42 referring, of course, to the film about Jackie Robinson from last year, for those of you who aren't sure what that's referring to. Uh, and Philip Rottingham, you also asked about 42 and, and why I didn't like it. There were quite a few things about 42 I didn't like, actually. I didn't think it was a very good movie at all. I felt like it combined all of the most boring, generic elements of a biopic and a baseball movie, both narratively and stylistically. I mean, to me, Jackie Robinson is is a giant of American history. He is a true historical figure who is worthy of a great film being made about him. I mean, it's 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 a mismatch of the greatness of the subject and the greatness of the film. A great subject deserves a great film, and Forty Two is just feels really really pedestrian. And there were elements of it that stood out as being not just pedestrian, kind of banal, there's a great movie critic word for you, uh, but just outright bad. Like Harrison Ford is Branch Rickey. I do not... It, he, was, he was like a cartoon character with the big rubber nose and the, And he would talk like this, or I want someone who's tough enough to not fight back. It's like, what the fuck are you doing? Is this a serious movie or not? What, the, what, what can you possibly be thinking? Uh, so yeah, I just it, it just it was it disappointed me. It it felt uh, just generic and vanilla and bland. And someone like Jackie Robinson, who was a true hero, I mean a a true uh, signpost, a turning point in American culture deserves better than just, you know, a, a, a bland, you know, quote-unquote inspirational sports movie. And that's what I felt like 42 was. And that's why I didn't care for it. Raving Hatter. Hey there, Steve. I've watched your You Had to Ask vids for a long while now and never really had a need to ask anything, but now I kind of do. I'd really like to know what you think about the Universal Unitarian Church. My fiancé and I are atheists, and we don't want to attend to try and find some sort of spirituality. We're interested more for the social aspects, since we live in the South and there aren't really any atheist or secular groups around. We like the ideas that the UUs put down. I'd love to know what you think of them and their creed. Would you ever go, or have you ever gone to a UU church? My fiancé is convinced that going will end in some sort of Stepford scenario where we're turned into robots, but I'm trying to keep an open mind. Thank you. You're wonderful. I've never been to a Unitarian Universalist church, not because I have anything against the Unitarians, just because I'm not much of a, a, a joiner. I don't really yearn for the social circle like a lot of people do. I know there are many of our fellow atheists who, you know, go to the Sunday meeting things or go to atheist uh, meetups or the atheist church phenomenon that has attracted some people because they, they even though they don't believe in any of their tenets of religion they nonetheless yearn for the society like you say like the communion the the brotherhood and sisterhood and uh, the the fellowship as christians would call it and i don't really feel the need for that i have my 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 own private life i have my circle of friends that's that's good enough for me most of the time so i wouldn't go for that reason uh but the unitarians that i have known in my life personally, and I've known a few people who identify as Unitarian Universalist, uh, they seem like lovely people, and they, they, they tend to be a lot more tolerant religiously of other people's beliefs or lack of beliefs than members of, of traditional faiths. Um, and I can't find a whole lot of fault with the Unitarian philosophy or teaching uh, itself either. I, I looked at their website. I have their website open here actually to their principles page. These are the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism that Unitarian Universalists are all supposed to affirm. Uh, first principle, the inherent worth uh, and dignity of every person. Second principle, justice, equality, and compassion in human relations. Third principle, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. Fourth principle, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Fifth principle, the right of conscience 
and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. Sixth principle, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Now that, <laughs> and there's some other things on here too. They also have uh, six sources, and there's a faint whiff of woo in that. Uh, but overall, that is far and away so much more progressive, so much more enlightened and modern than stuff you would hear in almost any other world religion, including especially Christianity and Judaism and, Muslim, and uh, uh, Islam, the, the big three uh, monotheisms. So I give them credit for that. It's, it's definitely a much more palatable form of religious faith uh, than the typical modern mainstream religions. This next one is from American Slime. Hey Steve, long question for you. I have a bit of an ethical dilemma and I figured you might be able to relate. Yesterday I was hanging out with my girlfriend and a guy friend of hers. He took us to a shop that sold tabletop games and wanted us to play cards with a few friends of his. I'm not a gamer in any aspect really and tend to find people who are pretty off-putting, but I figured I would try to be open-minded. So we sit down and immediately one of the guys we were hanging with starts making a lot of really obnoxious, racist, and misogynistic jokes. My girlfriend, who's half Chinese and a rape victim, was clearly uncomfortable and frankly I was just getting pissed off. This guy unfortunately turned out to be a complete stereotype of the skinny white nerd in all the worst ways and he clearly thought being comfortable with saying a lot of ignorant shit made him edgy somehow. In short, he reminded me of myself at 15, except he was in his 20s. Eventually, I told my girlfriend I had to get up early tomorrow and had to get some work done before going to bed, which was true anyway, so we left, which she appreciated. In retrospect, though, I felt like I should have done more to make it clear I thought he was being a complete asshole. On principle, I tend to think putting up with that sort of behavior really just amounts to condoning it. I didn't say anything because I didn't want to make things awkward, and I knew that I would end up being drowned out by all the people around him who clearly would have taken his side. Still, I feel bad about my reticence. Have you ever been in a situation like this? And if so, how would you suggest dealing with it? Is it worth making a big deal out of it? There are two stories from my own life that, that come to mind. First is one that I told in an episode of this series a long ass time ago, I can't even remember which episode it is, um, about a time when I was maybe in my late teens or early 20s and we were sitting around talking and drinking beer and this acquaintance, he was telling a story about something or somebody and he mentioned a person uh, in the story who was uh, a black person and uh, he stopped in telling his story and he said well I mean I guess we don't have any nigger lovers here sort of including me in the group and I wanted so badly to say something or to just stand up and leave and I didn't do anything I just sat there and continued to listen um, and I wish that I had said something. I really wish that I had said something. Even though I don't think it would have made any difference, it would not have made him any less racist, but it would have felt good to me to throw it back in his face or to tell him, you know what, I'm, I, hey, I'm, I'm not in the club, okay? Don't assume that I'm in the club, because I'm not. Uh, and then there was another time when I was working. I, I used to work maintenance at a truck stop uh, in Hagerstown. And there was a guy, a truck driver in the bathroom who was having some sort of trouble. He had broke, his truck had broken down or he, need, he needed, he was asking me for, for directions or if I knew a, a good garage around or something like that. He wanted my help with something to do with his truck. And he starts throwing the word nigger around. Like, you know, some nigger hit my truck or so. I, I don't even remember what he was saying, but he's, he's throwing that word around. And that time I did say something. He, I said, could you, I said, could you not say nigger? And, and he was like, what? You know, like he was sort of taken aback that I would challenge him on it. And I wasn't even challenging him, him that forthrightly. I remember being kind of nervous when I said it because I never stood up to somebody for saying something racist in front of me before. And I was kind of like, I wanted to be like, you know, plant my feet and stand up tall and say, don't say that. Take your ignorance somewhere else, pal. And I didn't, it wasn't like that at all. It was very sort of, very tentative and very sort of like, mm, you know. But at least I said something, <laughs> you know. I felt good for at least putting it out there. Again, just for, purely for my own sake. I have no doubt in my mind that it did not change that guy's attitudes at all. But for my own sake, 
to stand up for myself, for what I believe in, for what I think is important and right, and say, I'm not one of you. Just because we have the same skin color, don't think that it's cool with me for you to talk like that or for you to have those sorts of beliefs and attitudes about other people. It's not cool with me. But yeah, I, I, I know in, in my experience with that first story I told, uh, I wish I had said something. And I would like to think in the future that I will say something if I'm in that situation again. Uh, so that's the best thing I can tell you. C. Bluebeard, your thoughts on Ferguson, Missouri. Oh, I have thoughts. <laughs> I had wanted to do a standalone video about the Ferguson situation, but I kept dragging my feet and putting it off and putting it off. And now what I'm going to do is the next video in the Five Stupid Things series, the, the current events version, the red version that goes up on Monday, uh, four of the five things will be about Ferguson. I am hard pressed to recall any recent event where things have gone so wrong, so badly, so needlessly as they have in Ferguson. It started out as uh, a cop shooting an unarmed civilian, a white cop shooting uh, a black civilian, and that should have been the worst of it. Uh, if the Ferguson Police Department had, had taken the attitude of, uh, you know, obviously our officer shot an unarmed person, this was a terrible mistake on his part, we are removing him from duty, we are going to investigate, we're, and basically if, if they had taken the attitude of, we screwed up, or one of our guys screwed up, and we are going to make this right, but that's not the attitude they took. They took the exact opposite attitude. They circled the wagons. Uh, they behaved and continue to behave as though the, uh, the good name of their officer and of their department is far more important to them than the safety and the peace of mind and the, the sense of justice of the community that they are tasked to serve. And that's a huge problem. And, th and everything they have done since the shooting of Mike Brown has just made it worse, has just exacerbated an already tense and volatile uh, and very long-standing situation. I was not aware, I'm, as all, we all are aware now, there's a history of very harsh, you know, tight racial tension in Ferguson, as there is throughout much of the South and in Missouri uh, in general. Uh, but everything, they, everything the police department has done since the incident that kick this whole thing off has been wrong and has only served to make it worse. It, it just, it reinforces my opinion that police brutality, especially racially charged police brutality, brutality of a white officer on a black civilian, is one of the most stupidly inexcusable crimes in our country today. When police brutality and racial tensions between white and black are constantly in the news, are constantly on everybody's mind, are defining our interactions on an individual level, as well as things we do on a cultural and societal level. How these sorts of things continue to happen is just beyond me. How people can be so stubbornly fucking stupid as these cops in Ferguson to not only continue to fuck up in huge ways and 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 to to inflict needless damage and violence on communities and on people but then to react to it in such a tone-deaf and self-serving self-centered wrong-headed way it just it 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 infuriates me and it frustrates me and it makes me think what the fuck is the point like how can we, if we can't learn from the last 400 years of the history of people living on this continent, then what the fuck does it take? But at the same time, there are the overreactions from the other side. I don't think that the Ferguson Police Department's atrocious behavior is a sign that we are living in a police state. I do think that the militarization of, of local police departments is a problem. I do think that local police departments generally don't need to have 
military style equipment on hand i i'm not really cool with that but i don't think that that i think that's just an uh, a, a symptom of just sort of over arming and kind of insecurity and paranoia on the part of the local police departments i don't think it's a sign that we're living in a police state i don't think it's a sign that we're all about to be marched out of our homes by jackbooted government thugs and uh, you know there, there's an over there's a, a an overreaction to it in that way that I, I just can't get behind at all. And there are also the people who are like, what about the police officer? And you know, well, white people don't riot when a black person kills one of us. And that, all that, that completely ignores the cultural context and acts as though black on white crime is, is exactly the same as white on black crime, which in principle it is, but practically in the real world context of our culture and our history of racial tension, it is not. Uh, that, that sort of thing just makes me want to punch something too because it's so stupid and, and willfully ignorant of the cultural context in which all of this is taking place. So the, the incident itself, the, the crisis itself is infuriating and frustrating and some of the uh, extreme reactions on either side to it are also frustrating. There's basically something in the Ferguson situation to piss off pretty much anybody. Jeremy Westerman, so I noticed something humorously eccentric about you, or possibly your wife, in your last Off Monday Ramble, episode 15, when you are folding your laundry from the dryer. You pulled out a couple of blue bandana handkerchiefs. I doubt you are a bank robber, square dancer, train bandit, hobo, car mechanic, 80s break dancer, cowboy, or gang member, so I assume you use it as a pocket snot collection to catch sniffles and sneezes. This is something I have only encountered personally from a much older generation than yourself, as most younger people disdain a personal germ collection multiplying and festering in their pocket and choose to use Kleenex or some other brand facial tissue where the clean surface to use against their face next is more readily apparent, or even use toilet paper when the need to blow their nose arises. Can you defend or comment on this peculiar antiquated tradition and elucidate why you perhaps do not use tissues instead, Grandpa? It's an old habit, uh, one that I picked up from my grandpa, my pap, and also from my father. My, my father uh, used and continues to use handkerchiefs, much as I do. Um, and, be, and also because it's convenient, because I, I have allergies. Allergies bother me. I, on any given day, my nose might be running or not, you know, and it's, it, it can be like a constant thing, and it's just, it just makes more sense, practically speaking, to have something on my person, however disgusting, uh, to blow my nose with or, or to wipe my nose with rather than to have to keep constantly reaching for tissues. Um, although when I'm home and it's a really bad allergy day, I do tend to use tissues instead of the hanky, but, uh, but I always have it and I often need it. It's just, yeah, it is, it, it's, it's disgusting. It's gross, but it's a, to me anyway, it's, it's a practical necessity when I have allergies, uh, that are bothering me that can be like a constant battle. It's also a really good example of what a stubborn and inflexible person I can be because when my wife and I first started dating, uh, we each had a personal habit that the other found absolutely disgusting. With my wife, it was chewing gum, which I still to this day find revolting and I can't believe anybody ever does it. Uh, and with me, it was using my handkerchief. And within a few years of us being together, my wife had completely quit chewing gum. Like she doesn't chew it at all anymore. And I still use the hanky on a daily basis. <laughs> so, I don't know. I, you, depending on how you look at it. Does that mean I win? Does that mean I'm a huge asshole? <laughs> it probably means both. DZOSU071. Dear Steve, I've been checking out a lot of best ever lists lately. Greatest films, actors, etc. And I'm wondering how much merit the things on these lists actually deserve. I feel like no matter what anyone says at this point, the Citizen Kanes and Godfathers of the world will always be amongst the greatest films ever. But what if Dumb and Dumber is actually the greatest film ever? If someone asks me what the greatest film ever is, should I say Citizen Kane or Dumb and Dumber? Does this question even make sense? <laughs> it makes sense if you understand the nature of what is being asked. And what is being asked is an opinion. Uh, there is no such thing as an objectively good movie or an objectively bad movie. Movies are good or bad because we think they are good or bad, because we have decided that they are good or bad. So if someone were to ask both of us the question, what is the greatest film of all time, and I were to say Citizen Kane, and you were to say Dumb and Dumber, neither of us is objectively correct 
or incorrect. And the value of those lists, those best of lists, is nothing more than to stimulate conversation, to get us talking, to get us comparing movies that maybe we wouldn't compare otherwise. And uh, to people who are movie fans, who are, who are fans of particular actors, it's just, you know, one of the fun parts about being a movie person and talking with other movie people is having those conversations. Comparing and contrasting and arguing about, well, what about this movie? What about this movie? Why don't you like this one? Why should I like that one? It's just fun. <laughs> and it's, it's, it can be enlightening, you know, and, and that's one of the great uses of art to us is not just to enjoy it for whatever it is, but also to talk about it, to engage with each other about it. Uh, and to, to swap ideas uh, and those best of movie lists by taking the opinions of a particular person or a particular group of people and reducing it down into an easily digestible format that can then be easily compared with other similar lists it just it stimulates conversation and that's the use of them and that's what I use them for that's really the only thing that they are good for uh, you can't argue that, you know, well, Roger Ebert said that this was the greatest movie of all time, but, you know, uh, Pauline Kael said that this was the greatest movie of all time, and, you know, who, and I, you're missing the point. There's no such thing as, a, as the objectively, universally agreed upon, inarguably best movie of all time. It's not as if, you know, Zeus is like a huge movie fan and he's going to come down from the heavens and settle this argument and say, you know, Clash of the Titans is the greatest movie of all time. It's not going to happen. Although, I think that might be Zeus on his way now. He's not coming to settle the movie question. I think he actually might be coming to watch The Lightning Round. Rapid fire questions, glib and adequate answers. 2805DN, why don't you just get his and hers toilet paper holders? Well, maybe that solution would work for you, rich Uncle Pennybags. Troubleshooter125, I have to ask? No, I don't, so there. Blah. But I'm going to ask anyway. What's your favorite place to go out to eat, or perhaps the top two or three? You know, I am a man of, of simple pleasures who likes awful food prepared terribly. Therefore, one of my favorite places to eat is actually the Waffle House. I love the Waffle House. I would eat there, like, every day if I could, if I thought that it would not kill me really soon, which it probably would. Love the Waffle House. Uh, Radical Bacon. I was going through my subscriptions, and I realized that many of my favorite YouTubers are white men with brown eyes, brown hair, receding hairlines, and beards. That even describes my ex-husband. How should I correct for this bias? Well, you know, it is a bias, and I suppose we should try to rid ourselves of biases just on, in principle whenever we find them, but it, it sounds like this bias isn't really all that harmful. It's not a harmful bias. I mean, even you say your ex-husband, so I assume if he was a problem, he's been taken care of. You know, so uh, what's wrong with uh, digging YouTubers with uh, beards and brown hair? I just, you know, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't see the problem. Um, <laughs> Natalie Kirk, Steve, who would win in a fight, Ray Comfort or Ken Ham? Ray Comfort would win because he always has Kirk Cameron close at hand to step in and help out if necessary, whereas Ken Ham, I believe, uh, has no friends. Lewis Ng, 114, if you have the ability to read minds, assuming you didn't already, whose mind would you read first? Uh, my wife's. I, and I would be conflicted about it because I would feel horrible about violating her privacy, but at the same time, it would make my life so much fucking easier. Gabor Cosber, what about vertical toilet paper stands? God, that is that is admitting defeat. That is like a weak compromise. No, no, no. It's over, not under. It's over. No, no vertical. It's a coward's way out. Randy Owens, Steve, favorite Robin Williams movie? You know, I've been thinking about this for the last, you know, I guess almost two weeks now, and um, it's, I think it's probably World's Greatest Dad, one of his relatively recent ones, which is a really dark comedy, made all the darker now because uh, uh, a, a major character in that film dies in a way 
similar to the way in which Robin Williams actually died, which makes it, you know, it sort of amplifies the sadness of that film and makes it a little uncomfortable to watch. Uh, but it's a really great movie, really funny, really just a, a jet black comedy. It's a really great movie, and I think that's my favorite Robin Williams movie and a great performance from him in that movie, World's Greatest Dad. Jason Brene, Steve, what are some questions you would like me to ask you? Oh, I don't know, Jason. Maybe you could ask how I am. You know, how's it going, Steve? Are you well? Do you feel okay? How's life? What can I do for you? How can I help you? You know? Um, the Ronwald. Hey, Steve, what's your favorite ice cream flavor? Do you take it straight or with toppings? I would have to say my favorite is uh, chocolate chip cookie dough with chocolate syrup on top and uh, whipped cream on top of that. That, Jesus. Does it get any better than that? I don't think so. Nuno Uno 001. Out of all the topics you covered in your Five Stupid Things About series, which one do you consider to be the stupidest of them all? Wow, that is a tough one. Uh, probably, it would have to be one of the conspiracy theories, and probably uh, the moon landing hoax, I think, is the one that, that I find the most personally offensive, because I have a great reverence, respect for the space program, and for astronauts, and for everybody involved in the space program, and, and for moon landing hoaxers to say, ah, oh, they never landed on the moon, it was fake, on the basis of nothing but their own appalling stupidity and ignorance and you know, paranoia and whatever. It just is incredibly offensive to me and incredibly stupid. So if I had to pick one, I would say probably the, the moon landing hoax conspiracy theorists. That's it. That's it for the questions. I am almost done. But before I get out of here, uh, I want to do a shout out. And my shout out this week goes to an old pal of mine, someone who has been a, a subscriber or viewer of mine for quite a few years and, and someone who I've always liked. And uh, it's Nicole S.D., and uh, he just started a new series on his YouTube channel called Christian Glitches, where uh, he, he plays video clips from uh, Christian uh, apologists or preachers' videos and sort of points out the silly things that they say. It's, 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 it's the sort of thing that we've seen a lot of on YouTube over the years, but uh, he does it very well. He has a great personality. I love his accent. He has a wonderful voice and a wonderful wit and sense of humor. So his new series, Christian Glitches, just started uh, as of... This recording, I think he only has one episode of it up so far, uh, but that will be ongoing, so check that out. And he has a lot of other content as well, great stuff about uh, creationism and presuppositionalism and responses to Christian apologists and religious arguments, and just a really charming, great guy with great content, uh, good production value. So, Nicole SD, my friend, the shout-out is yours this week, and uh, looking forward to seeing more of that Christian Glitches series. Um, well, everybody, that is it. I am out of here once more. I will be back again next week to do this all over again, provided, of course, that you ask me some questions, because in order for me to do this, you have to ask. So please leave a comment on this video asking me your question for next time. Ask me anything about anything. No question is too serious. No question is too silly. And I will try to answer as many of them as I possibly can next time. So take care, everybody, and until next time, I'll see you.